Hey, this is George. Hey, this is Frage. And this is Real Talk with George and Frazier. What's going on, brother? Nothing much, man. No, but my hands are getting what that means, right? Oh, yeah, man. I, Listen, that mean, right? <laughs> I can set it up from here, brother. Listen, we got a banger today. I've been actually trying to get this interview for a year. This brother, it was actually the first one to give me my interview when I dropped my book. I've known him since college, so I'm not going to tell you what time that was, but go Kane University. I'm going to just say that when we went to Keene, it was called Keene College. When we okay. left, it was the university. That's all I'm going to say. So, I mean, this brother's an entrepreneur, a business coach, man, into finance. We're just going to bring him into the show, Mr. Fredo. Rafael, welcome to Real Talk. Welcome to Real Talk. He tried Thank to you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, watch out with George. You almost told the age over there. You almost told the age. You guys undercover school your age. Yo, friends, you see, I, I show you, y'all can't see them gray whiskers, man. I shave, so you know I ain't telling nothing, man. Uh huh. See, you start leaving us with our gray. We ain't shame our gray. We have our gray. That's it, man. Fraser, Fraser, I'm trying to grow these things. I don't know how to grow this, man. It's not growing. Oh, man. You gotta cut Fraser. it and keep growing it. Do you go to COVID and go COVID all over again? Don't get your haircut. <laughs> Got gotcha. you. COVID, COVID lockdown, that's all. That's all it is. Definitely all it is. Fred, man, welcome to the show, man. Don't let me take up all the energy. Tell the fans and listeners about you a little bit, man. No, definitely. Thank you, guys. So my name is uh, Fred Raphael. As George alluded to earlier, I, vis I attended Kenya University for my undergrad. Uh, I did an un undergrad in marketing and I did my uh, grad in um, MIS, which is uh, Management Information Systems. So I did that for what, six years straight. So I didn't take a break. Sometimes I feel like when folks take breaks, you get a job and test the real world and they don't go back. That's right. So, yeah. I, did, <laughs> so I decided to go straight. From there, I got a job into a marketing firm out in the New York City. I did that for about a year and a half. And within that year, I think 9-11 hits. And then from there, I was lucky enough to be recruited by a financial institution. So I did that for about 19 years. So uh, a lot of my experience um, in financial education uh, really stems from my dad, I would say. I've learned how to do business through my dad. And people say, you can have an undergrad, you can have a grad, but seeing the interaction of how people are supposed to deal with folks from a retail perspective, uh, to provide the level of service that we know we can provide in our community, which I think uh, it's something that's lacking in a sense. I think a lot of, especially minority business or black businesses to be uh, more specific, struggle with service. And then in service, you get your loyal customers and then that's how you should drive your business. But I think that uh, there's definitely a gap that, that we can talk about. So I learned uh, how to deal with folks one-on-one -on -one from my dad. Uh, the masters then help in that category. I knew uh, I knew finance before I got into finance. That's right. And, uh, and you know, that's when a handshake meant a handshake. And uh, my father always said to me, George, you let, the, you let the, someone borrow $100, see how they manage. And then if they can't repay you, then you know how to deal with them going forward. So those learnings I've kept throughout my career uh, just to be able to do that. But I have coached uh, numerous uh, bankers in the financial industry on how to manage money. Then during the pandemic about, few years back, I uh, decided to do something called a virtual uh, entrepreneurs network, something similar to what you guys do, giving folks a platform to be able to to voice their opinion and share their, their learnings. Uh, what I've learned through there is so many businesses do not know the ABCs of business. They don't know how to create a proper business. Uh, when we had the COVID and they were giving all these funds, most minority businesses struggled because they did not have the proper formation paperwork to take advantage of those loans, uh, which puts us far more behind than we were in the first place. Uh, so that's why you see a lot of those barber shops, restaurants, beauty salons, those small businesses, they're failing because they don't have the capital to help drive the business. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Look nice and beautiful in the hole over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely want to expand upon that, Fred, because I know that, um, you know, Frazier and I both are in real estate. You're in real estate as well, too. You have a lot of different things happening. And why do you think that that is? Is it just poor learning? Is it just that we as a community don't understand it? Or 
we're just, how do I say, we're just too much in hustle mode to learn anything else because most businesses really started as a DBA and they thought that that could take them. And there was nothing wrong with a DBA until they found out that a DBA wouldn't work for PPP. They needed more, yeah. you know what I mean? Or something else. And yeah. when you're moving, you've done it for 10 years and all of a sudden somebody says that that doesn't work. You know, how do you transition? And the reason why I'm asking that is because most business fails because they're undercapitalized. All the businesses that I've had that have failed, they failed because I was undercapitalized. You know my story, Fred. I spent almost 10 years looking for a portfolio loan for my real estate. You know what I mean? And it's just that journey and understanding it. So can you explain a little bit more about the funding part of it and capitalization? I, I think I think part of it is uh, it's a lack of education for our small business folks within our community. Uh, we do have resources out there. But resources are as good as having somebody tell you where to get them. Right. Uh, I think folks spend so much time on different social media platform, uh, <laughs> uh, doing uh, wheels and then talking about uh, different kind of videos instead of once you have the idea, then it's one thing to have an idea, right? It's like a great chef, right? Saying, I want to open a restaurant. You may know how to cook, but can you run a business? It's two different right. things. That's right. Uh, just because you're great at cooking doesn't mean you can go ahead and open a restaurant. Because believe me, believe it or not, the financial part is even more important <laughs> in creating that environment. So I think a lot of people have the idea. Uh, they don't know how to raise capital. Maybe from family members, from leveraging their properties, right? They have uh, different avenues going to a bank. Most black folks, I, I mean, I've dealt with it in the past, don't, know, don't even have an account. Right. Uh, if you don't have an account, you don't have credit score, you don't have the, the basic foundation of how to set yourself up, how are you going to run a business? So I think, first of all, we need to uh, educate young folks uh, very early on, you know, how to really manage credit, how to manage their day to day, how to budget. And then from there, the education has got to continue in a sense where uh, what kind of business is good for me, right? Because you have different... Uh, you have different uh, CF, CDFIs out there that's going to teach you, okay, so do you want to open a sole prop, right? But what does the sole prop, what's the impact? When do you use a DBA? Do you do an LLC? Do you do a, a corp? So yep. those, those conversations got to happen uh, before you actually put together uh, the business. And then, you know, uh, a few years ago, not a few years, about 10, 15 years, I had a chance to speak to Magic Johnson at a seminar and he said fred most people when they ask me for money i said put together a business plan come talk to me and most people he said that cuts out 50 75 percent of the people because they just come at them with an idea well i want to open this but where's the business plan because you got to forecast for the business before even the business gets created right like you yeah. know what what platform you're going to use where what 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 the demographics you're going to be in and what you're projecting as income, because people's gonna buy, people buy, letting you borrow money on future earnings, right? right. It's, it's the potential of okay, I have this this uh, data that I have based on this demographic. This is what the current businesses in that area are earning, and this is how much we will need. And then this is why I'm asking you for sixty, a hundred, twenty thousand, thirty thousand. So the, having the business plan, first of all, I think it's gotta it, as basic as it could be, right? as basic as it could be. Then from there, seeing an accountant and talking to uh, different folks to get an idea of, okay, how do I want to form this, this company? And then once you get all those things in place is being able then to shop around the idea of, okay, what exactly do I want to do, right? So I think that's, that's part of the problem uh, of not knowing. And then folks are not comfortable going to a bank because they are afraid of any financial institution. They are there to give you advice. You don't have to open an account, but I could go to any bank and ask about investment. I can't, they don't know how much money I have, right. <laughs> you know, <Exactly. laughs> they don't know that. And if I'm opening a business, I could tell the idea, Hey, listen, what account you think would be great. Can you point me to the right site? Can you tell me where I can get this done and be able to do that? So that's really where the education and why I think this platform I'm on today and any other platform that talks about and giving people a voice, uh, it's critical to kind of focus on that. True. Right. But let me, let me let me touch back on the LLC and a court. A lot of people have confusion on what's the benefit of being an LLC and the benefit of being a court. And it's sometimes having a hard decision how to file. Like, don't want to do an LLC? 
but don't be a court. Like, can you explain it a little better to help people understand which is which and what's the benefit of each one? Well, well um, I, I, I'll give an overview because uh, legal, <laughs> legally, <laughs> I'm not a, an right. accountant. And, I got uh, but I think most folks, if you're just starting out, you should really do a sole prop, right? Because there are tax implications. You could use your social and you could still get checks made payable to the business and just uh, spoke about it earlier doing a DBA. So it could be Fred Raphael DBA. I don't know, whatever the name of the business is. And then when I do file taxes, I'm still using my social or you can still use an EIN uh, number. But that's very simple, very basic, because as you know, when you're filing uh, business taxes, it starts at five to nine hundred bucks. That's so right. if you don't have to, you don't need to. So I would start with a sole prop if it's something I'm doing from home. If it's uh, if let's say I'm a makeup artist, right, or uh, I'm a photographer, uh, things like where you can really operate on your own, you could start it that way. Now, uh, when you get to where, if I'm going to a wedding, right, and uh, there are liabilities attached to that, where I can screw up certain things, I can get on a ladder or on a table to take a picture, or I can injure somebody. I usually say that's when you start looking at LLCs that is a limited liability company where uh, you cannot personally, they can come and attack your personal properties. It's more on the legal side where you're going to sue the business, not me personally. Uh, as you move up the ladder business-wise, so some folks then will graduate into a corporation where you're not touching anything at all. We can put everything under the corporation, right? And then manage from there. But it's different scales and different parts of the business. Uh, if I'm opening a real estate, well, I'll probably stay in an LLC front uh, and be able to do that. So that's really how I would gauge it. But uh, the laws and regulations change every year, every month. Yep. You know, I have a friend I used to pay. Uh, we used to do stuff to cash up. And I said, you know, cash up now, what they do, they put uh, a $600 regulations where yeah. if you if you transfer somebody more than 600 a year, now you got they got to do a 1099. So the government is looking to get the money. Uh, I think the other part, Fraser, you had uh, spoke about uh, why most businesses fail. Uh, they don't want to form the legal entity because they don't want to pay taxes. Exactly. If you're evading taxes and you don't want to do it the right way, uh, you're going to run yourself into trouble. And I've helped a lot of businesses as far as like, okay, what did you do? You didn't file for three years. And then they tra they're getting charged per partner, five five $500 a month per yeah. partner. And they have six, seven partners. Next Whoa. thing you know, you have a $14,000 bill. Then that's going to take, uh, you know, I definitely decrease your cash flow for the business. Exactly. Yeah, Fred. I like that. You know, yeah. tell them maybe ducking taxes. Yeah, exactly. man. And I'm just like, look, y'all don't understand. You yeah. know, the easiest thing about taxes is for me, it's just like you have to. That's why I tell my wife all the time. You know, the funny thing is everybody laughs at me when they be like, oh, well, you wrote off your sneakers. You wrote off your martial arts uniforms. You wrote off this. You wrote off the sweatsuit. And I'd be like, yeah, that's my uniform. Those are my scrubs. Yeah. You know what I mean? They don't carry yeah. enough expenses to balance out their taxes, or their tax liability, so to speak. You know what I mean? Right. And as a holding a personal training company, yeah, I, I wear sneakers to work. I don't wear hard shoes. So when I have to replace those, those technically for me are a tax write-off. You know what I mean? Even my cell phone that I use for work is a tax write-off. So they don't understand that per se when they get into those ranges of things. And I think that's where a lot of people get caught when it comes to that. Speaking of ranges, I want to transition to the restaurant business, brother. You got two restaurants. I know we've been talking about that since college. I know, you know, your mother's cooking everything, man. Tell the people about it, Fred. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so about nine years ago, um, so I've always had the idea of getting into the retail business. My father, so I grew up, I was born in Haiti. I came here when I was 13. So my father used to own, um, I, I, I won't call it supermarket, but it's somewhere along that line, right? A boutique supermarket. We also sold a lot of uh, stuff in bulk, uh, made be uh, sodas from anything you could think of. So that's really where I started learning the retail part of the business, uh, how to interact with clients. Uh, for me, 
uh, most black businesses, I'm going to say black, just to be very specific, uh, fail, especially in the restaurant side because of service. Mm -hmm. uh, just because, you know, George, if George walks into a restaurant, it's, their service level still got to be there. Right. That's, you yeah. know, I may know you from college, but guess what? There's a level of, of service that you expect when you walk into an establishment. A uh, 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 simple, how you doing? A simple, uh, sir, may take a seat or have a seat. And what would you like? Things that are that, that very basic. I find that we lack in our community because we get so comfortable knowing that like, oh, this is another brother walking in. But Fraser may have had 15 things in his mind yeah. And he comes to the restaurant to be able to decompress, relax, and have a great conversation, creating an environment where people are comfortable, that the, there is the proper ventilation, the music is at the right, the right you know, sound. It's not too loud where you can converse. Uh, the counters are wiped. So I've always wanted to kind of provide that service for the community, even though I'm Haitian. Uh, I, I do sell mostly Haitian food, but it's not a Haitian business. It's a business for everyone, especially for the black community, because there's a disconnect in the community where uh, Haitian, uh, uh, African American, and Haitian and Caribbean and Africans overall, we don't really consume each other's uh, goods like that. We don't eat. I don't yeah. know, you know. So because there is this thing where uh, an African American, well, a black person will go to a Portuguese restaurant and eat their food, but they won't go to a Ghanaian restaurant or Nigerian restaurant because the lack of knowledge about the, the, the food, but we have the best food uh, on the planet. So hands down, if it's from, all of it's from Africa, right? So mm -hmm. I tried to capitalize on the service part, uh, most of all, when nine years ago uh, from Kenya University. And uh, so we found a spot, partnered up with a young lady that had a Colombian restaurant uh, and she was failing miserably from what I was told. And we form a 50-50 uh, partnership. Uh, which is why I talked about the, the, the LLCs and leveraging the right partners and know the formation people before you get in. At that time, I got in saying I'm 50-50 partner, but on paper, I was just nobody because everything was under her name. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, you get a joint venture, you weren't into it. I saw the vision. I don't think she saw it. I like the location. Yeah. I knew that I had a niche market because in that area, they didn't have any sit-down Black-owned restaurant in Elizabeth, New Jersey that I know of, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, especially Haitian. So I figured, I said, she's struggling, but I know I can thrive in that environment. So we formed a partnership. Uh, on paper, she was still 100% on liquor, 100% on everything else, but we had a verbal agreement. But folks tend to do business, you know, certain ways. Yeah. And I tell you, uh, it, it followed me for a long time to kind of clean up the books just to be able to kind of get a loan. And hopefully, uh, thankfully, I was I'm in the financial industry, so I knew what I had to do right away. Uh, so we opened the restaurant. We've been there for nine years, provided the community. But the restaurant business is the most trickiest. Uh, you got to be up to par with uh, with the food industry. You got to the retail part, the connection part. Uh, the networking, which is a lot of people, like I said, you can be a great, you can have great food and still fail. Right. Yeah. Right. That's true. Still fail because the service level is not there, but the books may be killing you. Right. You know, because yeah. people don't know simple things. I have a liquor license, uh, George. If if you walk in with uh, a liquor license in Jersey, range anywhere from 100 to 200,000, 300. If you know Hoboken, it's about 800,000 uh, right. to a million. So, it, it, but folks in our community think I can walk in with my liquor. Well, if you're drinking that beer in my establishment, you then buy it there, you choke on it. Right. I'm still reliable. Exactly. You, come in, you understand? Exactly. So we had to do those kind of education. People come in outside and they want to walk in with their own food. Well, if you get food poisoning from food you bought next door, I'm responsible for that. So you cannot eat that in my establishment. So certain things that we had to do from a service level as well. And then from there, I learned that business. And then we uh, went into New York City. Uh, we opened a restaurant on Lower East Side, which is a whole different ballgame. I mean, I thought Jersey was tough. New York City is insane. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, oh, financially, from the compliance piece of it, from the inspection, from the hood cleaning, you know, and, and, and I've always wondered when I go to certain businesses why my clothes smell like food. 
Right. And and yeah. you realize that a hood range from fifteen thousand to thirty five thousand to buy a proper ventilation for your restaurant. So that's right. why most people, you know, they do the shortcut and they, you know, so you learn these things as you go along, but having the proper foundation from the business plan to to the compliance speed of it to the LLC, making sure that you have all those dots, because other things now is marketing, right? Exactly. So I exactly. opened a business during COVID. 2020. So in the middle of COVID, and I, I saw an opportunity while everybody was running away from the city, I said, this is the time to pitch forward and get a spot in the city at 50% discount. Everything was uh, at a discounted price. Oh, right. uh, so I got that. So we only had the outside because you couldn't let people inside. So from my overhead perspective, we know that we had to hire, but so many people uh, instead of opening at 12, we open at 5 to kind of cut four hours throughout the day where we know there was not mass traffic. So that's how we've been able to manage. But it's every day, there's a connect with the team. There's a huddle. There's a conversation with the chef. There's a conversation with the manager up front uh, from your uh, uh, website to how do you drive people. So, But that's really it in a nutshell with the two restaurants. And now we're looking to expand uh, hopefully in the Atlanta or the uh, uh, Miami market. Well, oh, great job. Great so job. Miami. Come to Miami, baby. <laughs> I told That's... you Miami where you're at, Miami. I told you, Joe. Right. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, now, it's tough down here. It's going to be tough. I'm going to lie to you on that one. It's going to be tough down here because you got a lot more competition. Where, what I mean, like, we were Jersey. We got a Chinese restaurant, a liquor restaurant. Now, see, those two down here. You got a cafe, a cafe, a McDonald's, mm -hmm. a Burger King. All on the same street <laughs> and all compete at the same time. Right. Then so there you go to, you find a lot more oversaturated of Latin restaurants. Right. Then, yeah. too, down here, like not saying that like, the Caribbean don't get it, they have a lot of animosity towards each other. So if you open a restaurant right next to each other, why are you open here for? Go down the street, go way down the street, go way, way down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 Fraser, you know what's fun, interesting? A McDonald's. A Burger King and a Wendy's will be on the same block, and no say nothing to each other, and no, and no one cares, right? Exactly. So, because it's what differentiates you is your marketing and your service level. So we can have three, four uh, black restaurants on the same block. Listen, yeah. people go out to eat every day, but not every day I have a taste for the same food. Right. So right. everyone can get some shared love if they work together. Um, next to me in New York is a Jamaican restaurant, and then across from me is a Bahamian restaurant. So we have three Caribbean restaurants in that same corner. Uh, so usually if somebody comes to me and I say, listen, have you tried that next door restaurant? They have great Jamaican food, right? And I'll talk about the chef from the Bahamian because they don't come to me every day. But if we can keep our community engaged, there's $2.3 billion in tri right. trillion right. in this community that we have not really seized on or touched on because we're looking at that business from a perspective of where we have 15 million banks competing. They're all competing in their own ways. We have many major global companies competing in the tech world, in the service world. Yeah. They do it in a way, but guess what? They create that returning clients. They have this recurring business coming in. We don't know how to create that because uh, in our community, it's always like what's hot right now, right? right? Yeah. It's like this restaurant open. It's like hip hop or whatever music. It's like, oh, yeah. this person used to be hot. But listen, Jay-Z is still hot. Right. Because yeah. there is a way that you know, you look at long term. We don't look at people look at short term businesses, short term uh, 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 success instead of looking at what's the long term plan. Because we exactly. can have this for 10, 15 years, but you got to create it and create it in the right way. And exactly. not go for the gimmicks, you know, because uh, our community, we, we tend to do a lot of that. This is the hottest club. And after three months, there's a big ball and it's done. Now we're <laughs> looking right. for the next spot. So. That's right. Fred. That's right. Fred, I want to expand yeah. upon that, what you said about delivery, because I don't know if you've heard about Ghost Kitchens being in the industry and what Door DoorDash and they are doing. How did you keep your business from being exploited like that? You know what I mean? And just to expand upon that, what... Do, ghost kitchens are is apps like DoorDash and some of these other apps, they have these locations where nobody comes in. All they do is prepare the food and deliver it, you know, and because they have the 
app that everybody uses. So Fred's restaurant has a great Caribbean dish and it's $29 for the dish, let's say. They'll recreate that dish and sell it for $24 because it's just delivery anyway. You see that? Yeah. And so when you look at your app and go, well, should I spend $200 or $150? I'll spend the $150 thinking, now you're getting a Caribbean dish, but you're just not getting it from Fred. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. business. How did you, how did you deal with that, especially during delivery and, and COVID? And how did you adapt to that in your marketing? Uh, so we had to pivot. Uh, most of our traffic, um, folks were coming in to pick up their own food, which saved us money, right? Because DoorDash, uh, Uber takes 30% off top. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So when you buy a meal from me, I pay Uber 30% of that money mm -hmm. and I keep 70%. Now, uh, from uh, we had to get creative with the pricing. So usually what you would pay online is be it'll be a discounted price not discounted but the regular price let's say my dish is 30 an uber it may be 36 dollars because i gotta i gotta be creative and say how do i transfer that extra six dollars at 30 percent if not you go under so that's one way to do that the other way was to create some incentive for people to come in and actually pick up the food and we were giving them a five or ten percent discount for driving in and picking up that food, right? Uh, with the uh, terminals, uh, uh, with the POS terminals, they have different um, ways. So the idea with money, right? A business is, there's a cycle of how, so you want to get your money faster, pay slower, because what's in and out, right? <laughs> <It's looking> at, <laughs> so when you look at the business cycle, how does a dollar go from point A to point B? And if it returns to me negative, I know I have a failing business. That's if right. it comes back at one a dollar and five cents, I know I got to keep growing it till it's doubles and triples. So when we looked at that, so one way was looking at the menu and say, okay, how do we get creative with that? We created the incentive for people to come in and, and drive in and pick up and pick those up, right? And then and then our way was to talk to all the vendors to say, listen, I'm getting this from you at $30. Can we bring that to 28 something, say $2 per item? So we had to get creative with everything from buying to, en to inventory and to even the marketing piece of it as well. Because uh, I'm right now in New York, across from me is a ghost kitchen, right? Uh, they, I mean, when I tell you, they have loads and loads and loads of space and there could be 30 30 restaurants in that basement cooking right food wow. and that's how they will kill that business so we had to get very creative with the marketing get very creative and and, and also networking and what i've also done george is create an atmosphere where people want to come in and they wanted to just come in and be around people i think as human beings, you like the interaction. If not, you can never be in a relationship by yourself, right? It doesn't exist. Exactly. But we love to be in a, a, in a relationship with other human beings. So creating different, at night, I started doing live bands. Mm -hmm. uh, even sometimes I was doing virtual connects. Uh, that's how the idea with uh, virtual entrepreneurship came out because I wanted to create a, a community where even from the restaurant, we were playing. Well, I had a DJ when we couldn't let people inside but the dj was spinning live but i was investing that money for me it was a form of marketing so by yeah. the time we opened the door and said now nah, you can come dine in everybody wanted to get in right. right so you you have to change it if you can stay stagnant there's no such thing in business uh, uh, you know nice. true nice. but let me ask you a question too so rest want to do what i call when they start out with good quality food but like you say overhead cost cause you to go cheaper on the food and the quality kind of joins it a little bit over to offset the cost. How do you avoid that in your business? Still get quality food, but at the same time, still manage to tweak the price to where you still can make a profit. I don't think you ever cut down on the quality level. And to me, it's a mistake that people make. You know, most businesses, when they're failing, the first thing they do is what? They cut marketing. But right. how do people... <laughs> marketing is supposed to keep you afloat. Uh, so for me, as far as from a production part, you don't cut down on the food you buy. You don't cut down the product, right? Uh, you can look at hours. 
you can have one person doing two or three jobs, right? So if I have a chef, maybe used to do more inspection and inventory. Now you got to get in a little bit earlier, cook, maybe you do a little bit of the cleaning. So I can cut some bodies out without impacting my level of service and my, the quality of the food. Because the moment you do that, then you're going to lose out all over. Because then when people start tasting that food, they say, you know what, they opened it five months ago. It was great. Now the service is not good and the food is crappy. And most of the time, if you are in a great mood, whatever the food tastes like is good. Right. The environment. <laughs> Yeah. You, you can't take away from that environment. When we meet your friends and you guys drinking and eating, the food always tastes better because the conversations are better. The environment is great. So you got to keep that package together. It's like I always tell people, if you're planning a wedding, you don't, you know you want a $15,000 wedding. You don't start at $5,000. You do a $25,000 budget yeah. and you cut down. But as you cut down, you want to keep the foundation together. Uh, the key to any restaurant or any retail business is service and quality of food. So you can't, you can't go and cut those out. And then especially with the chefs, if they're not happy, the food never tastes great. That's right. <laughs> That's yeah, absolutely that right. That's so true. Listen, Fred, I know you got to go, man. I appreciate you coming on. Really quick, tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Uh, I am uh, social media at Creole Image, the Creole, C-R-E-O, C-R-E-O-L-E image uh, as well. So um, I, uh, we have the restaurant in Jersey, with Fresh Republic, uh, and then the Lower East Side, uh, we have Rebel, uh, or both uh, serves Haitian, Caribbean food. We also have a clothing company named uh, under, I, uh, we have a store online, Rep the Image. Uh, if you see those shirts that I have on. Right, that's right. It's, uh, it's uh, nice. partnered up with uh, Economics Art, which is a, a designer. Uh, he's a painter, so we kind of created this web. The image is that I can. I uh, wanted to create some positivity where, when you know, folks feel so much comfortable wearing Gucci when they can wear something that George Bowley created. That's and right. I know who created it. I don't care about no Gucci, but I know where my dollar is going. But you know, the moment you start, you start uh, making another brother a few dollars, people start questioning. He's looking better than me, but they don't question other people. That's no one right. questions the McDonald's family the Wendy's family, but they will question you. But um, I find that in supporting uh, one another, this is the way we're going to build wealth That's in right. this community. We're not going to get there by investing our money other places. Uh, if Fraser has a business, unless the service level is not there, uh, uh, he's not giving me what I need. But if I can get it there, why go somewhere else? Why go spend my money? So that's really the model for me. And, and really, uh, when you look at the Black Lives Matter, all these things happening, it's happening because every time you got to go f uh, f complete an application somewhere where you're not wanted, you're going to have issues. And we're not building wealth. People with money within the community need to start investing within the community to ensure that don't just talk the talk, right? but build yeah. businesses that George's son or daughter or my wife, other people can say, I'm going to apply and I know the service I'm going to get. I know I'm going to get a job. Very, very uh, seldom you find uh, the Chinese folks working. You go to Chinese restaurant, right? It's always Chinese people yeah. working. Right. But I'm pretty sure other chefs can do the job. But they've created that community where they reinvest. Now they have the buying power. And for us, that $2.3 trillion or more dollars got to be spent within the community. That money in the Jewish community before I go spends, I think, somewhere around... Uh, 16, he spent about 31 some days in that community. In the black community, it's less than an hour. That's so right. meaning that we don't buy anything within our community. And until you have that, where I can buy my hair product, I can buy my clothes, my shoes, glasses, everything I need within that community, we're not going to build the wealth and we're going to all struggle and until we can pull together. So, True. Absolutely. Well, so I want to tell you you got three questions for a young person who's trying to open a restaurant up. Like three good tips you can give them that will help them, help them out pretty good. Uh, I would say the first thing first, obviously having the idea, but looking at location, I think location is key. Uh, finding out exactly why you want to open it there and pull your data. Do your homework as far as demographic. What's the average spending uh, power in that area? Uh, then that will help you determine your pricing. Uh, for, for your food because you don't want to overprice and you definitely don't want to underprice it. 
but you want to price it right. Uh, secondly, uh, talk to friends or family members. You got to raise capital. Uh, if they say you need 30000 to get in, you need 90000 because right. within the first five, six months, you're going to run into yeah. some obstacles. So you want to make sure you do that. But uh, the third part is creating some kind of uh, marketing for the business, right? Uh, the best thing a friend can do for you is we post, post, create some kind of vibe just so that way you can start building a, a portfolio or clientele for the business as well. But those things, and definitely not forgetting the formation, uh, go in and don't cheat the process, you know, create the right business plan, talk to your accountant and find a way exactly how can I structure the business to be successful, not just tomorrow, but in 10, 15 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you want to say it, George? You want to say it, George? No, go. Okay. That's your phrase, phrase. Go ahead. Oh, say it. I got it. Hey, tell everybody when you come to the show, welcome to the George and Fraser family, brother. That's right. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you, George. Thank you, Fraser. Guys are doing an excellent thing. And I think just being able to have a voice to share my feedback and some of my background and, and anyone that needs to reach me as well. Uh, thank you, and thanks for inviting me to the family. I appreciate, appreciate it, brother. It. And a blessing. Be blessed. Enjoy the rest of your week. And if I want to talk to you, Fred, have a great Christmas. And a All happy right. New Year. To you, I'm going to take a restaurant. I'm coming to you. I'll check your restaurant. I want to get there, too. All right. <laughs> All right, now. All right, my brother. George. Told you. Yeah. You heard how he kept, just kept dropping those pearls, <laughs> finance, business plan, oh, you yeah. know, circulation of a dollar. How come we don't hear that much about it when it keeps talking about it. You know, we, you and I say it about keeping money in the community. Exactly. You see how meticulous it was in that particular business front and structure because of the ability to survive economically and how competitive, you know, that particular area of business and restaurant is. It's, and it's so, true. As you put, as you put a point on it too, how you can have a McDonald's, Wendy's, pizza, all in the same, no conflict. But if you have three Caribbean restaurants, if you don't work together, you have conflict. Oh, yeah. You together, you can make more money than the Wendy's or the McDonald's, and you support each other. That, I, I think the greatest fear is that we work together. Okay, well, nobody tell you. The well, you know, the thing together. is that, that, that I like Fred is Fred hasn't changed. You know, Fred and I were in the student center. We, he was also active, uh, you know, in, in, in the, um, in, uh, I forgot what it's called in school, the multicultural center. You know, he was always active and he always preached the same thing. I mean, we were there as West Africans, West Indians, African-Americans, and it was all the same thing at Keene that we put in place and we went and we supported. Even the Afro-Latinos, you know, we tried to bring them in in the Latin, Latin community because they wanted to kind of try to be separate because yeah. we were just like, look, we're all in the same boat here trying to do some of the things. Exactly. So he really hasn't changed and it's grown for the last 20, 25 years and to see his visions come to fruition man is definitely really really good exactly. i mean you gotta stick to it like you said joy you gotta stick to it and once you believe it achieve it you know that yeah, like the one why we created a show for a platform to give you a voice like that to highlight that and bring the ideas and points to everybody can understand it and be aware of it because nobody says anything nobody knows about them that's right you know? and don't know about it, they cannot implement it you know and understand what he's trying to say understand it's everything Education is our greatest weakness when it comes to that. We rather work for somebody else and make them rich, work for ourselves, yeah, and make ourselves rich. Cause it prove it, George. Who work harder than we do? Let's be honest. We work two full jobs as one person versus somebody else who works one job and complain about it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, look, it's just a mindset. It's definitely a mindset, and this is something you know as an entrepreneur that, that you just have to do and want to be able to do it and understand it, but. I definitely appreciate him coming on, man, and dropping definitely. that. And I was, I was having fun while he was talking. I know he was good thought teaching over there, George. Like he's a teacher, teacher over there. <laughs> yeah, man, definitely all good. Hey, y'all, check us out. Like I said, uh, this month we have uh, two more interviews coming for the rest of the month, and then we're off for Christmas and New Year's. But hey, this was George. Hey, this is Fred. Hey, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Hey, follow us. Keep me keep updated. All new shows coming up. So, hey, keep us in mind. That's right. Peace. This is Fraser, and that was Real Talk with George and Fraser. I'm George. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>